Good morning, and today we are going to finish chapter 10. Today is the seventh week of the semester, which means after today we will be halfway done. We will be halfway there. We will be living on a prayer, okay? You folks don't like playing that game. It's one of my favorite games. Polymorphism. Polymorphism is a buzzword. Whenever you talk about object-oriented programming with somebody, uh, they, they always seem to want to go, well, yeah, that's polymorphic and yada, yada, yada. And um, so if you know that you, you're in, in the talk and if you understand what's going on, that's just great. But we all know poly means many. Poly means many. Uh, takes many shapes, okay? So let's see if we can get this straight and I can explain it correctly the first time. So we can use something called polymorphism in object-oriented programming. And what it's saying is something can take the shape of something else. And in this case, what we have is a superclass reference variable now, let's talk about creating a reference variable. What you see here, I have a super class called graded activity, and I'm creating a reference variable, calling it exam, okay? So a super class's reference variable can reference objects of a subclass. So as I'm creating this, uh, you know, we've been doing Graded activity exam equals new graded activity. And, and that process is to create a reference variable and then reference an object of type graded activity. Well, with polymorphism, we're gonna let it take different forms and we're gonna say, I have this reference variable called exam, but what I'm gonna do is make it an object of the final exam class because it's a subclass. And that's the only, only direction I can go, okay? All right, okay, so let's see what we have. Before we would have written something like this, as I mentioned a little while ago, graded activity exam equals new graded activity. But because of polymorphism, we can say that the object is of type final exam and we can call its constructor sending in, and if I remember final exam well enough, it was 50 questions, seven missed and a bunch of things were, were gotten from there. So now- I have a question. Yeah. So um, you're- the subclass is more like a specified, um, a specified program, something similar to like what we did with chapter eight. Well, super class is kind of like the represents the general perspective or something like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Just and wanted to we, make sure. As we go through the, the next two sections in here, you're going to see a little bit more where that comes into play. But again, the graded activity, <laughs> is a super class, excuse me, and the final exam is going to be a subclass. And we know what's the what's the word that comes into play with a subclass? That it inherits everything from graded activity. And then we got into conversations about we can override a method in a parent class. And we're always overriding every time we do a two string because we're overriding from the super super class called object. We know there's a couple of things in object. We don't really need to delve into it. Um, so, I have yeah. a Go ahead. Yeah. Um, what's the benefit of making the reference variable like um, fi a final exam reference variable opposed to just regular inheritance? Good question. Good question. Haven't found a use for it yet. Nope. Okay. But what it said, and, and that this could be uh, something that you do as a, 
in your third year or a fourth year class. But I, I have, don't have a vision of why we're actually using it. Oh, okay, thank you. Yep. So polymorphism does exist. And, you know, again, I have the phrase here, polymorphism is the ability to take many forms. So this reference variable exam can create a reference variable exam, can reference a final exam object. All right, so exam's got some craziness going on. Now, what do we know about exam? Um, what do we have? One thing is exam can only use methods of graded activity. Exam can only use methods of graded activity. And graded activity was, in fact, the super class. That's a big one. You know, that's kind of important. It can only use them of the super class. Now, well, what, I can only use those, but I can also use the constructor here and possibly be able to call my super constructor. And I know hopefully that some of you are plugging right along with our next assignment because we talked about using super and a couple of different things. And... Um, that chain of inheritance, one person's done. I think you have till what, Thursday to get it done? So yeah, JFeth Sakin said yes. Okay, so let's take a look at a couple more examples. Um, I have graded activity, it's a super class, exam one, uh, final exam. Yep, because I can, I can do polymorphism over here's the FE for final exam. I have to keep writing these abbreviated UML charts down so I can see who's the parent and, and so forth. Um, exam two, again, the parent, the subclass. The parent, the subclass. Even though the subclass is down in chains of inheritance. So polymorphism. Now, Okay, sorry, but you said it doesn't go the other way, right? It does not go the other way. That is correct. Okay. So, but could yeah, I'm sorry. If there, were th if there are three in the chain, could the third one be of the type of either of the first two? That's correct. Okay, thanks. That is correct. So, so this is basically like an extended, a massive extended version of classes from chapter six. In some way. Yes. Yes. And it's all object-oriented programming. So a lot of what we talk about from here on out is, is just going to keep revolving around creating classes and working with objects. Okay. I'm, yeah, I'm kind of getting a grasp of it. All right, good. So other things going on with polymorphism. A, a little while ago, I mentioned that we had overloading. We had overriding. Overloading was same name, different signatures. Overriding was when I had a method in the super class and a method in the subclass. Not only did they have the same name, but they had the same signature, same parameter list. So if I got ready and I ran something, which of those would it use? Because because a moment ago I just said if I have a subclass, it would use the super class methods right here. Exam, up, oh, you can't see it. Exam, still can't see it. Exam can only use methods of graded activity because it is a reference variable of that type. But Java says, well, we have this thing called dynamic binding. And sometimes you're going to hear the term late binding. And if they both have you know, the same thing going on where it's overwritten, we have a problem. And what binding will do is um, binding is matching a method with the correct method definition. So if I have the object, which is of the subclass, the dynamic binding would in fact take me to the newest version when I'm overriding a method. So if I had one in graded activity, 
if I override it in final exam, it would actually use the one written in final exam. Even though there's one in graded activity and we're only supposed to be able to use the methods of the super class, it'll actually use the overridden one. All right, so there was a program that is called polymorphic.java. And if you go to uh, D2L, and I wanted you to load up polymorphic.java, you're also gonna need to load up graded activity. So polymorphic.java, graded activity, final exam, pass fail final exam and pass fail activity. And I have Did you to, uh, repeat that one more time? Go to D2L. You're going to see a bunch of files that I want you to download. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm at the files. One That's of them is polymorphic.java. Okay, you got that one. Yeah, you're going to need graded activity. You're going to need pass fail exam or pass, yeah, and final exam. Um, I'm not seeing pass fail on D2L. I just see final exam. Uh, ba -da -ba -da -ba -da. All right, let me pause. So here's an example of dealing with this polymorphism. I'm going to get ready, and it looks like I create an array of three reference variables, graded activity type, type, okay? Test sub zero, new graded activity, which means I'm allowed to call set score. Because if you remember back in graded activity, we had set score, get score, and I believe it was called get grade, which gave us a letter grade, A, B, C, D, or F. And again, graded activity, we, we're, we're okay with that, right? Pass fail exam. Now the whole polymorphism starts to come in. So test one is this. I call its constructor, sends what it needs to up to the super. Get up there now. Third test. This time it's the subclass final exam that's being called. And as you can see, I'm going to go through and I'm going to test whatever it was one, two, or three. The word score. I'm using get score. That was a method in graded activity. And I'm using get grade, which was a method in graded activity. So for test one, I got a grade of A. For test two, I got a grade of P. And if I look back, test two was of type pass fail exam. And in pass fail exam, I did an over ride of get grade. So now the DB dynamic binding comes into play and it's using the method binding and it's using the method in that subclass instead of the one in graded activity. I think I'm getting it. So what you're saying is for the second part, for the second um, test, the part where it tells whether the whether the score is a passing or failing that overrides the letter grade. Yes. Rep replacing so, the letter grades with ABC instead, 
and you putting instead the pass fail to determine whether you pass or fail. That's right. Absolutely okay. correct. Thank you. Somebody give that fellow a gold star. Okay. And, and again, um, you know, here's, here's some calls down here of some things that we were doing and, and it's all, and then we clap our hands and go, okay, polymorphism. We got it. You understand it. Raymel got it. He feels pretty good about it. Any questions on polymorphism? Again, you, you ever want to check? You can come in here. And if I started doing rectangle R equals new cube, that comes in. And is this a legal statement? Uh, Letter A, is that a legal statement? Well, it uh, doesn't match the cube constructor, at least. It does match the cube constructor. It has a parent class as the reference variable. It references an object of the cube class, which is a subclass. And all that's good. Oh, I miscounted there. Three. Yeah. Yeah, three. Uh, um, does. So what, yes. what happens to the fields when you create that? So for R, does it still have the attributes of all cube and it can only reference the methods of rectangle? That's or is correct. it? Okay. So, so it's really just the methods that get restricted to whatever that are you know, right. top level. Okay. H pretty much goes by wayside unless what? Why would H be any kind of factor? Because remember, I'm only using the methods up here. So if it was that overloaded or not over, overrided function in cube that had the same name? Right, right. So is there overriding going on here to make that a possibility? So I have a set length width, length of get area, and I have da 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 da. -da. So, so no. There's no dynamic binding coming in for it to look for a method that is overridden. So yeah, the, the H really has no play of anything coming in here, okay? Because none of them are overridden. Okay, good. Next section, 10.8, 10.8, something called an abstract class. And we have abstract classes and abstract methods. Yes, that's fine. Take care of what you need, Patrick. An abstract is, so I'm now going to create some goofy classes. I'm going to start with 10.8 and have one in 10.9. And sometimes you need to be the boss. And you need to lay out rules for how some things are going to be written. And know some things are going to be your subclasses. And you may want to dictate, because this is probably going to be a group project of eight people. And we want to make sure things aren't helter-skelter. So we're going to start with section 10.8. We're going to talk about an abstract class, something called an abstract method. All right. So an abstract class. I get ready and create it, but nope, I'm never gonna make an object of that class. I'm gonna lay out some rules and then I can have subclasses that will be able to use it. But I am never gonna create instantiate an object, a class that is not instantiated, but other classes extended. No objects, but I plan on having subclasses use it. The second thing, an abstract method, is a method that I write and put it in an abstract class. And that method um, is only the name of the method. So that when the subclass is created, 
that method has to be overridden. Okay, little summary. Abstract class represents a generic class form of all the classes that it inherit from it. So I'm putting some stuff there and then I'm going to tell Darren to go write this and Raymel to go write that and Adam to go write this, but you're going to use this class and you're going to create subclasses to come off of that. I also want to make sure everybody has a method called a certain thing. So I'm going to make it an abstract method. I'm going to put it in my abstract class so that I make sure you all have one of those in your subclass that you're creating. Okay, let's take a look at an example of that. Um, there's code listings on D2L for 10, section 10.8. I want you to load up student, comsci student, comsci student demo. And again, a lot of what this is, is just coordinated efforts, trying to get uh, the groups that are building this gigantic project all on the same page, using the same verbiage, using a bunch of the same things. Give you a couple seconds to... Anybody need 30 seconds? Through the use of magic markers, you can see that I have public abstract class student. So this is how I create an abstract class with the word abstract. Some things that I have in here, name, ID number, year admitted. Name, ID number, and year admitted. So this may have something to do with uh, students and their majors, but these are things that I wanna make sure are labeled as name, ID, number, year admitted, uh, string is string and integer. I wanna make sure all of that's set. So I'm dictating this in my abstract class that we have those things and they are available. <laughs> Uh, let's see, the next thing, the class is called student. I'm able to have a constructor. I'm able to smear the red. I'm able to have a constructor. The three things I'm bringing in, name, ID, number, and year. You notice I also have a two string. So this part, I've, I've written this. So when you extend this and write whatever your task is, a bunch of this is already done and you can go and just add on to it, extend it. Finally, in my abstract class, I have an abstract method. That means in your subclass, you're gonna to have to include an abstract method called get remaining hours, and it's gonna return an integer value. Uh, let's see, it must be overwritten in a subclass and it must return the remaining for the student, the hours remaining. All right, that kind of just says what I was talking about. Let's see it in some action. And I, again, I gave this to you in D2L. Here we go again. So we're back to extending student, super class, subclass relationship. I have some constant variables. I never use many constant variables. Some of you do once in a while. Again, that's one of those where I don't wanna go through the code and make changes. I wanna make changes up front and it's done. Well, we're, one of you was chosen to write computer science student. And it's really kind of funny to me that all com sci people say com sci and the author of our book puts comp. Sigh. Hmm. Oh, well, anyhow, some more variables become included. 
Remember before we had um, name, ID, and year admitted. Let's see, math hours, you need 20 hours of math, 40 credits of computer science, 60 credits of gen eds. Sounds about right. The magic number is 120, except I think when I had my comp side degree, it was 126 for some reason. A lot of gen eds. That is a lot of gen eds. Well, degree, gen eds. well, start thinking about your math courses. You know, there's 20. Where does comp sci usually start counting? Not till calc. So calc one, calc two, calc three. Uh, lots of comp sci courses. That's 10 credits each of the four years. I don't know. Let's see what's going on. I have, oh, nice. This is my subclass, computer science student. If I instantiate it, I'm instantiating it here with just the name, the ID, and the year. And this constructor's written calling the super class right away. Uh, set math hours. All of my accessors and mutators, right? Uh, set com sci hours, set gen ed hours. So I really didn't need a whole lot more for this demo, just a whole bunch of sets to get them in there. Now, ampersand override. Darren's liking that. She likes the ampersand override. This is the method that I had to override from that parent class, super class, base class. They all different names for the same thing. I come in and let's see, I have a variable called required hours, remaining hours. I do some da 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 da. -da Da, da, Can da. I ask a question? Yes. I wanted to make sure I understood this was from before when you were talking about polymorphism. Yes. When we have two different classes that have the same method, um, did you say that did you say that it it accesses the method uh, that's linked to the the class type that you named, like graded activity, even if you named it as a new final exam? Which method well, does it access? Graded activity was the parent. The super yeah. class. And final exam was the subclass. Late binding will take the override and use the subclass. Okay. Is okay. Even if you even if it's of a graded activity type. Yes. And okay. that goes back to we had this conversation. Right. About the A and this was the the method in the subclass, not in the super class. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, get remaining hours. It adds up the hours from those three classes that hopefully were inputted by the user. That's, uh, you know, we got the required hours minus the hours. I'm sorry, here they're inputted by to return how many hours are left. We add the two string. And, you know, this is what we learned in those chains of inheritance. We can call the super two string. That was a question in a conversation last week and somebody asked it and somebody answered it. And I said, I don't know, but we do call the supers. It takes care of the name, ID, and pop, 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 pop. You have a demo and you run it and it should output something that looks like this. The first three lines are from the super. The next ones, the next remaining lines are from the subclass two string. Any questions? Tying it all together, dictating, being in charge. This is just one way, these abstract methods. Uh, notes for UML chart. Abstract class is italicized to represent an abstract class. Abstract method is italicized to represent an abstract method. I like the book, still like the book. 
all the time. Okay. 10.9. Yay, 10.9. I have, oh, there it is, oh, there it is. Interfaces. So this is gonna be another relationship amongst classes, but not necessarily super class to subclass, parent class to child class. This is gonna be another relationship where I'm gonna write a class called an interface, okay? And, you're going to see how this interface works a little different. The interface is going to say, this is what I want in the subclass. So you have to, you're, you're required to override all of these things. Okay. It's like an abstract class, can't be instantiated. We know that. And methods must be written. We have to get in, inside of the, class we're creating, we have to do that. Uh, and again, its purpose is, if I'm the boss and say, I want all of you to be using the same names, I can dictate it by building an interface class and saying, here you go, I'm dictating it. Uh, you're gonna see the word interface. All right, I gave you some files. I'd like you to go load up. Relatable, final exam three, relatable exams and graded activity. I kind of tried to make that as easy as could be so you know which ones to load up. It's time to make the donuts. Okay, interesting term here. An interface is a contract. You're gonna enter a contract and you're gonna to agree to everything in the contract. So here is the interface I'm creating. It's called relatable. A moment ago, we had the word abstract here. Now we have the word interface here. It's going to be an interface. When I say you must implement your interface, implement, you'll see that in a second. It must implement your interface means you need to write three methods, an equals, an is greater, and is less. You're gonna have an object, call the method with an object going in. Yeah, we probably could have used this back not so long ago because we were doing equals is greater than and is less than because we were using them on objects instead of things that we had learned before. So that's relatable. Now I want you to go to final exam three. In final exam three, public class, final exam three, extends graded activity. So that means I am inheriting all of that stuff from graded activity, set score, get score, get grade. But I'm also implementing relatable, which means I'm gonna to have to write three methods. Okay, what do we got here? We have uh, ints and a double and another int. And oh boy, I come over and I'm scrolling down through line 18. That's just a constructor. I'm okay with final exam three doing all of the constructor work. Da, 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 da. Here is a method called get points each, get num missed. We're okay with all that. And now I start to get into, I have to create three of them because that's from my interface. 
When I said implements relatable, that means I need a Boolean equals. And we've written this. We've written this. A Boolean is greater. We wrote this as well. This is the calling objects get score method. This is the parameter, the local variable G's get score method. And also is less. Do, 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 do. And there was a demo relatable exams. You could pull that up and run it and find out if it's equal, if it's less than, if it's greater than, you know, because it calls those methods right here. An object passing an object, but an object calling a method with an argument that's an object. What if I wanted to do multiple ones? I can. I can just separate them by a comma. Can have lots of good interfaces. And then last but not least, what does it look like? Well, if I'm going to have an interface and I'm going to implement it, I write it to the side. So superclass, subclass, interface. Remember an abstract class was up above, coming down. Oh, that's great fun. Do, 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 do. I am now going to page 697. 697, number four, it's called essay class. Number five is called course grades. If you jump to D2L, uh, a new announcement was put out at 1030. I give you some files. I think I give you an essay class. Is that correct? I see an essay class. You do see it. That's a yes. So that's good. You see, we know we have graded activity. Okay, so essay extends graded activity. So we're okay with, thanks for writing that for us already. And we have a bunch of stuff going on there. But I want you to tie that into course grades. In a course, a teacher gives the following tests and assignments. Lab activity, a pass-fail exam, an essay, and a final exam. Well, we have a bunch of those already, don't we? Uh, write a class name, course grades. The class should have graded activity, array, name, um, Da, 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 have four elements, one element for each assignment previously described. Chapum, 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 and chapum. Okay. One of the things I would start with, a lab activity that is observed by the teacher and assigned a numeric score. A pass-fail exam that has 10 questions, minimum passing score is 70. An essay, assigned numeric score, final exam that is assigned that has 50 questions. Set pass fail, set lab, set essay, set final exam, and a two string that goes along with it. And as we know, we have a bunch of these already written. Did I give you one for lab? What was in that last group that I just gave you? Other than essay. I don't think lab was in that, I'm sorry. Okay, so lab is just gonna be a score observed by a teacher. So you can work that however you want. Okay, so I want you to put that into a program. I'm gonna look at, I see uh, 11 students if there was 12, I'd make three groups, but I'm only going to make two groups for breakout. 
Some people didn't want to come to class today. And I'm going to have you put this together. If there aren't any questions, I'm going to open it up. Next week will be week eight, and we will be starting chapter 11. Some of you from 162 are already good with exceptions, but we're going to look at them a little differently. So any questions at all? All righty.